Welcome to the numerical methods. So we moved to a new chapter. So we are in the chapter of time discretization of stochastic processes. So what we had in the last session is that I showed you, uh, I just defined a few time discretization schemes for ETO stochastic processes. And maybe the most important time discretization scheme is the Euler scheme, Euler Maruyama scheme. So this is here. So given an ETO stochastic process, so this is our model here, dx is mu dt plus sigma dw, initial value is x0, uh, coefficients may depend on time and the stochastic process itself. Then we define a time discretization, ti, i from zero to n, uh, so n time steps. Uh, t zero is say zero, and then it's increasing. And on this time discretization, we now define our numerical scheme. So x tilde at ti plus one is given recursively by x tilde at ti plus yeah, mu evaluated at ti and x tilde of ti, yeah, so which is known because we are going recursively step by step formatting time, times delta ti plus sigma delta w. So we have this time discrete stochastic process. So actually a family of random variable x tilde of ti at the n plus one different times, yeah, t0 up to tn. And here the delta w is the Brownian increment. Yeah, so w is the Brownian motion. And we learned also a few other numerical schemes, but I already made the remark that the Euler scheme, yeah, it is very simple, but it's maybe the most important one. And you saw this, already when I derived the Milstein scheme, because I derived the Milstein scheme or I motivated the Milstein scheme by moving to a different coordinate and applying the Euler scheme at the different coordinate. So that's also what you do for a log normal process. And we had this exercise also in the last session. So a process where you have that sigma depends here on x. Yeah? So say sigma is some sigma star times x. Yeah? So where you have some kind of dependencies there. So where you make an approximation error by using just a fixed x tilde. Yeah, then it's uh, a very nice trick to move to the logarithm of x, which will effectively remove the x in this coefficient. Yeah, and then you discretize the logarithm of x, and then you move back to the original coordinate by applying the exponential to the discretizations. Yeah? So you try to find a coordinate frame where you have almost constant coefficients to reduce the discretization error of the Euler scheme. And this is really the technique yeah, that is uh, very powerful, and that's the reason why the Euler scheme is maybe... Yeah, enough for our applications. What I would like to do today is to prove the convergence of the Euler scheme. Yeah, and we will also check the convergence rate. So the convergence rate of the Euler scheme. Yeah, we will have a look at strong convergence and weak convergence. And I will prove strong convergence in today's session. And let's do weak convergence then maybe in the next session. Yeah, so what are we doing? Yeah, speaking of conversions, I need actually a sequence of time discretizations. So I have here my time discretization. So my time discretization ti, i from one to n, but now I have a sequence of such time discretization. So that means there is a superscript n here, yeah, ti superscript n, which is a time discretization using n time steps. And I have the constraint that my time discretization is a discretization of, say, the interval from zero to capital T for some fixed time horizon capital T. So we take now the time interval yeah, from zero to capital T yeah, and create some 
discretization inside. So I have that T0 is zero and then increasing T1, T2 and so on is my time discretization up to Tn and Tn is equal to capital T. So since I have now many time discretizations, I have to use here this notation with the superscript N. Okay, so all these guys now have here a superscript N to tell us they belong to the time discretization having N time steps. So what I consider is now convergence in the sense that my time discretization becomes finer and finer. So I define now Hn to be the largest time step for a given time discretization Ti superscript n. So if this is, for example, an equidistant disc discretization, yes, or an equipartitioning, and so you have that the time step size is just t divided by n, so your hn would be just t divided by n. So clearly you have then that the hn in that case goes to zero. Otherwise, we just have an assumption hn should go to zero as n goes to infinity. So this is the first step when I now talk about convergence. So when I now talk about convergence, I have to say, okay, in which sense are we converting here? Yeah. So in which sense do we have convergence? So convergence in the sense that the time discretization becomes finer and finer. So in the sense that Hn goes to zero. Well, and then comes the second part. Yeah. So what is actually the object that is converging here? So we will prove now convergence. And actually I will also prove the convergence rate. Yeah. So we have like an Monte Carlo method and some kind of error estimate for our um, Euler scheme. But then this here is my Euler scheme. Yeah? X at Ti plus one, yeah? and actually now Ti plus one superscript N is X at Ti superscript N plus mu delta Ti superscript N plus sigma delta W Ti superscript N all now written using my specific time discretization. So this here is my Euler scheme and hence the solution that I'm creating here. So my family of random variables depends of course on the time discretization I have used. So I also need here the superscript N also in the specification of the X. Yeah? So you see there's always here this superscript that tells me, okay, this guy was now created by the Euler scheme using this time discretization. And now I would like to prove that this converges to the true solution of the stochastic differential equation. Yeah? So dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. Below, I have a time continuous stochastic process. Above, I just have a family of random variables. So in which sense does now this family of random variables converge to a stochastic process? So I have to work a little bit to define this. And this is here. So the above discretization scheme defines X tilde superscript N only at discrete time points, my points Ti, Ti plus one. No? And to further discuss the convergence, actually I would like to define a stochastic process out of those X tildes. So I would like to define the time continuous process of the Euler scheme. So I would like to define my process also at the times, little t, that are in between two time discretization points. So the question is, what is actually x tilde, so using now the time discretization with n time steps, of t? So what's that? So you could think now, yeah, okay, maybe you just connect these random variables 
using a linear interpolation. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, just define yeah the value in between as the linear interpolation of the two random variables. And then uh, you have a time continuous stochastic process defined out of your time discrete stochastic process. But this is actually not what we do. So what we do is we define the process of the Euler scheme. So the time continuous function now, little t maps to x tilde superscript n of t by a specific piecewise linear interpolation. And this linear interpolation looks as follows. So the value at little t, so at an intermediate point, is the value at the previous discretization point, so x tilde of ti. And now comes the part that really looks a little bit like you would just connect the random variables. So you just take a linear function here, yeah, t minus ti, with the corresponding drift term, mu. So look, if you put plug in there the ti plus 1 at the final point, you would have exactly mu times ti plus 1 minus ti, yeah? so mu times delta ti. So that's exactly going linear to the end point. But then note that for the diffusion part here, we plug in the stochastic process of the Brownian motion. Yeah? So here we have W of little t minus W of ti. Of course, if you plug in here for little t, ti plus one, you get exactly the Euler step to the end point, but it also means that in between you are stochastic. Yeah? So in between you wiggle with the Brownian motion around, yeah. and of course, since this is the same Brownian motion as you have used in the Euler scheme, your delta WTI here, you will end up at the correct value. So this stochastic process I have below here, this is now the time continuous stochastic process that I call the process of the Euler scheme. And what I would like to do is, I would like to prove that this stochastic process converges to the solution of the original SDE if hn goes to zero. So in that case, if my n goes to infinity. Yeah, again, maybe the remark that there were alternatives way of constructing this uh, stochastic process, you know, the time continuous stochastic process, and I am um, not doing doing this. So the definition we have here for the x tilde superscript n at time little t, yeah, for an intermediate point little t, yeah. This definition is different from a naive piecewise constant uh, interpolation. I just use the random variable yeah, and take this random variable for a given time interval. So this would be just map t to x tilde of ti, yeah, for t between ti and ti plus one, or um, say a piecewise linear interpolation. Yeah, so this is a piecewise linear interpolation where you yeah, map here t to say alpha times x of ti plus one minus alpha times x of ti plus one. Yeah? So x tilde, of course. So this would also be a possibility. Yeah, you could take a piecewise constant one, a piecewise linear one, and this is not what we are doing. Yeah, so we have here an Ito stochastic process that looks like this. Yeah? So we have explicitly the Brownian increment here. So this is a little bit as if you would interpolate the two points here and here yeah, with a Brownian bridge. Yeah? So you bridge with a Brownian motion, with a drifting Brownian motion. Yeah, maybe it's nice to um, illustrate the three different uh, versions here that, and you see a little bit what the Euler scheme does. So I have a numerical experiment in illustration 
which performs these three different ways of inter interpolating the time discrete uh, stochastic process. To illustrate this, I need the true solution. Yeah. So what should be the true solution of my SDE? So the true solution of my SDE is now an Euler scheme for itself, yeah, but it is an Euler scheme with an enormous amount of time step, 1,600 time steps. So I have a reference process. My Euler scheme with 1,600 time steps should be the true solution. So I think of it like being an SDE with piecewise constant coefficients having 1,600 steps in these coefficients. And now I would like to take this stochastic process and consider my three different ways of interpolating discretizations of this stochastic process, the piecewise constant one, the piecewise linear interpolation, and my Euler scheme where I now use a much coarser time discretization, say just eight steps yeah, or 16 steps. Yeah? So much coarser discretization. You find this code um, here in this um, experiments repository. So not in the one for the lecture. Um, in this uh, package, Monte Carlo Euler scheme called Euler scheme illustration, and I just want to plot a little bit how they uh, look like. So it's not so important that you now understand the code. Yeah? I'm using stuff that I will introduce a bit later, objects that yeah, make the world a little bit simpler for us. I will shortly step through the code and then we study a little bit the pictures. So I find this code here in this Experiments repository, it's Monte Carlo Euler scheme, and there is the Euler scheme illustration plot. So what do I do? I create a very fine time discretization. This should be my reference process, my true process, 1,600 time steps. I need a Brownian motion. Yeah, I have 100 sample paths. This is our Brownian motion using MSN random number generator. And then I take a Black-Scholes model. So the model I have is that ds is rs dt plus sigma s dw, or if you like to take an x, dx is rx dt plus sigma x dw. So this Black-Scholes model here is performing the log Euler scheme. So actually, um, it is the exact uh, solution. And then I create an Euler scheme with these fine time discretizations here. As yes, you see, this one goes into the Brownian motion. The Brownian motion goes here into the Euler scheme. This is the my reference process. And then I use different number of sub-steps. Yeah? So 1,600 divided by 200. So these are eight steps, um, 16 yeah, and so on, and the very fine ones. Yeah, So I have different um, coarser time discretization. So I create here a time discretization, which is coarser. And now I would like to look at the Euler scheme and these two interpolation methods on this coarser time discretization. So the first thing I have to do, I have to create S of Ti. Yeah? So using now, my Euler scheme, but now on the coarser time discretization. So you see there is some stuff going on. Yeah. So this here is a classical Black Scholes model yeah, feeding my Euler scheme. So you see that the coefficient in front of the DW is S times sigma. Yeah. So that's not so interesting here. Let's fold this in. And then I have yeah, created my yeah, reference model on the coarser discretization. Then I would like to create the true process of the Euler scheme. Yeah? So now using these S of Ti's, I now create R times S of Ti, T minus Ti, and I'm creating this stochastic process on the fine time discretization. So now I take the coarse discretization points, and I interpolate it using our Euler scheme.
process. Yeah? So I interpolate it with T minus Ti and W of T minus W of T, Ti. Okay, so this is a little bit done here. So you see, this is some kind of interpolation. Yeah, he is using the S at the Corsa time discretization, and there's some stuff going on that he has to find always the Ti that belongs to the T. Looks complicated, but actually it's not so complicated. Yeah, and then I perform some plots. Yeah, I plot my Euler scheme. I plot my piecewise linear interpolation. So you see this here is just a linear interpolation. I calculate here a weight. Yeah, and then with this weight, it is S at the next time point and S at the previous time point. Yeah, weight and one minus weight. This is a linear interpolation. And this here is just a piecewise constant interpolation. So I plot the three things. Yeah, again, uh, if you did not follow this, it's not such a big problem, yeah, because it's more important to see how the plots look like. Yeah? And um, let's study a little bit what he's generating. So this here is the true time continuous stochastic process. So this is my process using 1,600 time steps. Yeah, so first I generate all the three interpolations also with 1,600 time steps. And of course you see no difference, yeah, because I'm stepping actually in the original steps. But then if you take a coarser time discretization, you suddenly see that you have big differences in how the stochastic processes look like. So for the piecewise constant one using 160 steps, yeah, so 10 original time steps are packed together to one time step. Yeah, you see small constant values. Here you see linear values. And for the true Euler scheme, yeah, you actually see almost no difference. Uh, difference becomes maybe a bit clearer if we move to 16 steps. This is the piecewise constant one, the piecewise linear one. This is the Euler scheme. Or if we move to even coarser, just eight time steps. So this is the piecewise constant one. Constant, constant, yeah. It's a stochastic process, but piecewise constant, piecewise linear one. And here on top, you have the Euler scheme. So the Euler scheme, what is he doing? Yeah, you see that he has, if you compare it, for example, to the piecewise linear one, yeah? So we are here at 10 at this value, and then at 12, we move here up to this value. He's actually doing the same, 10 here at this value, 12 up to this value, but the way he is moving is with the Brownian motion with a constant drift and a constant diffusion parameter. So if we study this now, um, you see that if you take, for example, here this red path, there is now a difference visible. Yeah. So you see that here the variance that you observe here is a bit larger. Okay, so why is the variance there a bit larger compared to, say, this region here? Yeah, my stochastic process is dx is rx dt plus sigma x dw. So if this here is now my sigma of t and x, you know, so this is my, say, let's use sigma star, sigma star times x. So you see that the volatility parameter is becoming larger as x is becoming larger. And in my Euler scheme, in my Euler scheme, I'm still using here the x tilde of ti in the sigma. from the previous time point, but since the path is coming from a lower level, yeah, moving up, yeah, so this value is still small, yeah, so and I'm I'm wiggling up with a smaller coefficient sigma. 
So this is the reason why you suddenly spot differences. So here he's picking up the volatility change to a higher value much quicker. Okay, of course, the same uh, applies if you go down. Yeah, so he is becoming yeah, calmer, yeah, much quicker on the true stochastic process than on the Euler scheme. So you see that the Euler scheme discretization error comes not from doing some strange interpolation. Yeah, so what we do here or here, yeah, but it comes from the coefficients being constant for a while. Okay, so the process that we have created x tilde superscript n is an e to stochastic process. And the nice thing is if you look now at this stochastic process in the differential notation, what is the d x tilde superscript n? Yeah, you, you apply the differential and you get from the t minus ti that you have here below, yeah, you get a dt, so you just get a mu dt, and you get from the w of t minus w of ti, if you apply the differential, you get a dw. So you see that if you restrict yourself to this time interval here, and you apply the differential, then this is the stochastic process dx tilde superscript n is mu evaluated at ti dt plus sigma evaluated at ti dw. So it's just a stochastic process with piecewise constant coefficients. Piecewise constant on our discretization intervals. Yeah? It is an e stochastic process where we just freeze the coefficients mu and sigma to the starting Point. This is now a very nice notation when I would like to define now what does it mean convergence. So I'm comparing this stochastic process now to the stochastic process where the coefficients are just the mu of t and x of t and the sigma of t and x of t. This is now the third step in defining what does it mean that my Euler scheme converges to um, the true solution. Yeah. So first step in which sense? Yeah. Time discretization becomes finer and finer. My h n goes to zero. Second step. What is actually the object? It is this stochastic process x tilde superscript n of t. Yeah. And next step in which norm? So I can consider strong and weak convergence. So there are many different types of convergence, and we will discuss here two different types of convergence, the strong convergence and the weak convergence of x till the superscript n to the x. So let's recall the corresponding definitions. So I say that a stochastic process x till the superscript n converges strongly to x if, yeah, I take the difference of the true solution, the true solution x of little t, and the Euler scheme approximation x tilde superscript n of little t, then I take the supremum of these differences, yeah, of the absolute value of these differences. So I have the supremum of the absolute value of these differences. This is a random variable yeah, because you can still plug in the omega, the sample path. Yeah? So on each sample path, you take the supremum over the difference of the deviation of the sample paths. And then of this random variable, you take the expectation and the limit should be zero. So this is a little bit like taking, say, L infinity norm in time, yeah, you take the supremum and the L1 norm in space. Yeah, so you take the expectation. So the limit n to infinity expectation of the supremum over all t, x of t minus x tilde of t, this should be zero. This object here, the expectation of the supremum of the differences, this is actually my error. 
So I can define an error estimate or I can define a convergence order. So I say that X tilde superscript n converges strongly with order gamma. So I define here order gamma. If there exists a constant C such that the term is less or equal. So and now comes my HN the fineness of my time discretization, so the size of the largest time step, or if you have an equidistant time discretization, the T divided by N, HN to the power of gamma. Yeah? So this is the convergence order. So if your error, so the expectation of the supremum X minus X tilde, at evaluated at t yeah, is less or equal some constant hn to the power of gamma. So we will later prove that we have actually strong convergence of order one half. Yeah? So it's a little bit like a square root. Yeah. So if it is t divided by n, it's a little bit like a square one divided by a square root of the number of time steps. So like for the Monte Carlo guy. There is also the weak convergence. And the funny thing is that the weak convergence yeah, sounds weak, but it's more important to us. So what is the weak convergence? So we say that X tilde converges weakly to X. If for any fixed little t and any Lipschitz continuous function f, no, so this is a little bit like a test function, the two. So I have that the expectation of f of x, so my true solution, evaluated at this fixed little t. So this expectation minus the expectation of f of x tilde superscript n evaluated at, at little t. So the difference of these two expectations, this converges to zero. Yeah? So you could also say that the expectation of f evaluated on the Euler scheme approximation for a fixed time converges to the expectation of f evaluated at the true solution. So you only consider the stochastic process at a fixed time and then only consider expectation of a function of the realization that you observe at this fixed time. Yeah? So much weaker yeah, for any T and any such test function F, I would have, I would like to have the conversions. Of course, you also can define a convergence order. So you say that X tilde converges to X with weak order gamma, um, if again for any fixed little t and any test function, any Lipschitz continuous function f, you find such a constant c larger than zero that you can bound now this error by the constant times hn, hn to the power of gamma. Okay, and we will later prove that we can show we convergence order one. Yeah? So it goes like one divided by the number of time steps. Yeah, I made this remark. Yeah, we convergence is a little bit more relevant to us. So in our application, financial mathematics or derivative valuation, weak convergence is the relevant concept. Okay, and why is this? Yeah, consider our application. So what is the application? We have a model. So the model describes the market observed values by in, for example, Ito's stochastic process. Then these axes contain, uh, yeah, some market observed, observed quantities on which we can define a financial derivative product. So we have some payoff 
for example, yeah, if the stock has a certain value, I pay you maximum of S of T minus K and zero. So you have some payoff function or some value function you know, that tells you the value of a financial derivative at a future point in time, say a fixed point in time, capital T. And then you are interested in calculating the expectation of this because you have the universal valuation theorem that tells you if you do risk neutral valuation, so if you perform replication of the derivative, you can expect express the value or the cost to perform replication. You can express this as an expectation. So this is our application that I would like to calculate the expectation of a function of a stochastic process evaluated at a fixed time. So you see that in my application, I have these two ingredients, the fixed time and the test function f inside. Yeah? So and the question is now, if I use my Euler scheme, does the expectation of the function f applied to the Euler scheme approximation evaluated at this fixed time converge to the true solution. So this is um, exactly the situation that we are in if we consider derivative valuation and you see that this is then weak convergence. Yeah, small remark on the notation. Yeah, the notation has become a bit uh, messy due to this superscript n. Yeah? So I always have the superscript n in the Euler scheme approximation, also in the time step size and all these time discretization points have the superscript n. But if I want to prove now convergence, it's actually sufficient just to prove the convergence rate. So it's just sufficient to prove here this estimate for a given Euler discretization with time discretization that has maximum time step size h. So I say that I have a given time discretization ti with a given maximum time step size h. And for this given Euler scheme generated from this time discretization, I would like to prove this estimate with a constant that does not depend, of course, on the time discretization that have I have chosen. Yeah, a constant that may depend on the coefficients mu and sigma, but it does not depend on other stuff. So if I just want to derive an estimate in terms of the hn, yeah, I can ease a bit the notation and I can consider just a fixed time discretization level n, and I can just drop now the superscript n at the x tilde. So x tilde is my Euler scheme, the subscript n for the h, so h is my time step size, and the superscript n for the time discretization points. Yeah, So ti is just my time discretization. So I consider now my Euler scheme x tilde of little t is, yeah, for little t being between ti and ti plus one, x tilde of ti plus mu evaluated at ti and x tilde of ti, t minus ti plus sigma evaluated at ti and x tilde of ti times w of t minus w of ti. And this if I apply the differential, can be written. So now I make the notation even a bit nicer. This can be written as dx tilde is mu tilde dt plus sigma tilde dw, where mu tilde and sigma tilde are now just our piecewise constant coefficients. Yeah? So mu tilde of t is yeah, find for the given t, the corresponding time discretization point ti and ti plus one, yeah, such that 
little t is in the interval from ti to ti plus one. And then the mu tilde of little t is just the mu of ti and x tilde of ti. So this stochastic process you see here below is now the Euler scheme that corresponds to my model dx is mu of t, x of t, dt, plus sigma of t, and x of t, dw of t. So of course, if I work with the mu tilde of little t, I have to check yeah, where is the interval, yeah, in which interval is the little t. And then I will later plug in back this definition here. Yeah, but meanwhile, yeah, it's much nicer to use uh, this notation. So let's start and prove the strong convergence of the Euler scheme, yeah, the process of the Euler scheme to the true solution. To do this, yeah, I need to use some estimates for stochastic processes, yeah, so I cannot prove everything from scratch here. So I have a collection of four results that I need here. And then endowed with these four results, yeah, some you maybe already know yeah, from your lectures on stochastic processes, endowed with these four results, then we prove the uh, convergence. Actually, yeah, I sometimes I don't do proofs, yeah, because we need some time to do the numerical experiments, to do the coding and so on. And I like doing proofs if you get some more insights. And for example, the proof of the weak conversion is also a very nice one, yeah, um, where you get some insights. And here it's maybe also nice to see where actually the order one half of the strong conversions, where this is located, yeah, where where is it coming from? So let's have some estimates for stochastic processes. So for the proof of the strong convergence, we need some auxiliary results and we just state them here. Um, so the first result is that I have existence of the moments of the E2 process and the moments of the corresponding um, Euler scheme. Yeah, given that the coefficients behave well. Yeah, so this also states which assumptions we need. So mu and sigma should have at most linear growth. So what does this mean? So this means there exists a constant c larger than zero, such that for a fixed time little t, yeah, so I can estimate mu of t and x by c times t plus absolute value of x. So this should hold for all t on my, well, compact interval here from zero to capital T, yeah, for all times up to my time horizon. I would like to have at most linear quotes for the mu and um, the sigma. Yeah, why is this important? Yeah, this is important because you will later plug in here in the stochastic process the random variable, so the stochastic process x evaluated at little t. Yeah? And okay, then yeah, I, I would like to have some, some bound. So if you have this condition, then you have that for any P larger or equal to, you know, there exists a constant, and this constant, that is, may depend on the P, on the C, on the chosen time horizon, capital T, and it also may depend on the initial value of the stochastic process, you know, so my x0, you know, but it does not depend on the chosen H and N, so I want to have an estimate, yeah, um, independent of that. So, and you have your true solution x and the Euler approximation x tilde 
have the property that the supremum over all times, x, absolute value to the power of p, yeah, the expectation of this random variable um, exists. Yeah? So it's less or equal uh, k. So it's bounded. So this holds for x and for the Euler scheme approximation x tilde. So the quantities that I use here, they exist. This condition here have at most linear growth. This looks a little bit, a little bit strong. Yeah? So if you think of, these are now my coefficients in my model. Yeah? So you know, the Plex-Schultz model has this, this property. Yeah, It is ds is r s t t yeah, linear growth sigma yeah, is sigma star s p w so sigma star s so linear growth so the Black Schultz model has this yeah but you should not have something larger maybe and that this is a reasonable um, assumption yeah you see this because you have explosion in an ODE if the ODE has, for example, quadratic growth. Yeah? So recall the solutions of an ODE. So this means I just drop now the DW term yeah? for linear and superlinear growth. So if you consider, yeah, this would correspond to my Black Schultz model, dx is rx dt. Yeah, linear growth, yeah, Rx. You know the solution of this guy is x0 times exponential Rt. Yeah? So if you differentiate, you get an R in front. Yeah? You see that dx is yeah, R times x, yeah, dt. If you now look at dx is Rx squared dt, yeah, what's then the solution? A solution for this guy is one divided by one divided by x of zero minus r of t. So you see this easily if you differentiate here. So dx by dt is yeah a minus one, all the stuff that is here below squared, and then you have an inner derivative. So the inner derivative is a minus r, so I get a plus one times r. Huh? So you see, this is just r times x squared. Yeah, and this guy explodes in finite time. And you can even specify the time when it explodes. So it explodes at t T explosion equal, okay, so what is it? It is equal one divided by R times X zero. Huh? So if this is the case, this solution is infinity. A very nice uh, little observation, yeah? So for linear growth in the coefficient, you have an exponential growth in the solution. But for quadratic growth in the coefficient, you have explosion in finite time. So this assumption that my coefficients should have at most linear growth, it's maybe not such a strong or such a stupid um, assumption. So I need this result. So the next thing is that I need some continuity of my coefficients. Yeah. Uh, so assume that mu and sigma, they fulfill some global Lipschitz condition. So that means there exists a constant C larger than zero, that if I look at mu at T and X and mu at S and Y, so at two different times and two different state values, then I can bound it this by constant times the difference in time plus the difference in state. Yeah? C times T minus S plus X minus Y. And the same should hold for the sigma coefficient. Yeah? So sigma evaluated at 
different time, different state can be bounded by the distance yeah, t minus s plus x minus y. If I have this, then there exists a constant k such that the expectation of x of t minus x of s squared, this is bounded by, okay, there is some kind of constant. There's a k here, and there's also a one plus expectation of the initial value squared, yeah, so the variance of the initial value. But then there is a t minus s. So I can bound this by the difference in time. Yeah? So if time moves on, yeah, the values of my stochastic process, yeah, they deviate. And what do I have for the deviation? Yeah, this is a squared there. So this is actually the how the variance of the random variable x of t minus x of s evolves, what you have on the left side. So for little t equal to s, yeah, this guy is zero, and then the variance evolves. And you see that the variance evolves linear in time. Yeah, this also looks yeah, quite reasonable. Yeah? You, we know that this holds, for example, for the prone in motion. We have e to stochastic processes that build upon the prone in motion, and we do not get additional growth due to our coefficients because the coefficients have these this global Lipschitz condition. By the way, this is the point where the square comes in. Okay, You have a square here and a one here. So if you just look at the difference of the stochastic process, x of t minus x of s, you would expect on the other side a one half. Yeah? So it goes one half in a change in the time step. And this is uh, one place where the strong convergence order one half comes in, into our proof. So the second last ingredients I need is dupes martingale inequality. So let x denote a martingale e to process. So this means, yeah, if it is a martingale e to process, it means dx is just the sigma of t, x of t, dw. Okay, so there's no drift. And then if I would like to estimate, say, the maximum over all times, x of t, absolute value to the power of p, the expectation of this, for example, if the p is 2, yeah, this looks like the variance of this random variable, then you can estimate this with the expectation of x evaluated at time capital T, so at the last time, yeah, so maximum goes from zero to capital T here, so at the last time, yeah, to the power of P, with a coefficient in front P divided by P minus P to the power of P. Also, this looks maybe not so surprising if you have that your stochastic process starts stay here in zero and has some sample path, yeah. Well, what you do is you take the variance, if P is, for example, two, yeah, you look a little bit how large is here the variance, okay, and you see that the variance grows and you can estimate it by the value that you have at uh, a little bit at the end. Yeah? So you can estimate it with the value that you observe at the last time point, cap capital T. So we will need this guy in the proof. And another yeah, important result that we will need is the Ito isometry. So let phi denote an adapted stochastic process. Then we have 
okay, what's that? The expectation of the integral phi dw squared, yeah, integral from S to capital T. Well, what you have here inside is, yeah, this is actually X of capital T minus X of S for the stochastic process dx is phi dw. So this is including the integral. Then I take the square of this. No? So what you have there is the variance of x of t minus x of s. So this is what I have on the left-hand side. What I have on the right-hand side is that I integrate the coefficient phi over time. So the coefficient phi is the instantaneous volatility. So phi squared, including the squared, is the instantaneous variance over an infinitesimal time step So the whole expression is the accumulated instantaneous variance. Okay, so very important result, yeah, and we had it already a little bit, yeah, so you know the sum of two normal distributed random variables independent yeah, has variance being the sum of the variances. Yeah? And the integral is like summing up small random variables, the normal distributed increments having variance phi squared times the time step size. Time step size infinitesimal is a dt. So summing up all these is integrating phi squared dt. Yeah, very, very important uh, result, and I need this in the proof. So now we have all the ingredients, and we can show the strong convergence of the Euler scheme. So endowed with the lemma 76, yeah, the existence of the moments 78, yeah, so my estimate with the Time step size, yeah, the t minus s, yeah, the expectation of x of t minus x of s squared, yeah, can be bounded by t minus s. Theory 79, do martingale inequality, and lemma 80, e to isometry. I can now prove the strong convergence of the Euler scheme. Here is the theorem. So assume that mu and sigma behave well. So assume that they fulfill the global Lipschitz condition. So mu evaluated at t and x minus mu evaluated at s and y. Yeah, The difference of the two can be bounded by the difference in time step plus the difference in state, x minus y. And the same holds for sigma. So this is the um, assumption we have from one of our lemma, but it also implies the assumption of Lemma 76, yeah, so it also apply, Im, implies this one. If I have that this is fulfilled for the coefficients, then x tilde converges to x with strong order one half. So I have strong convergence. So the expectation of the supremum x of t minus x tilde of t is less or equal, a constant that maybe depend on the time horizon, c of t times h n to the power of one half. So I use the uh, notation, yeah, that we simplified notation that we previously defined. So I just proof now this estimate here and drop the superscript n and the subscript uh, little n. But first note that the claim follows from just proving a modified estimate where I take the expectation of the supremum 
of x of t minus x tilde of t squared to be less or equal c times h. Yeah? So the one half is removed, but instead I have a squared here inside. You see here, there is no squared inside, but on the other side, there is the one half. This uh, follows immediately from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality because expectation of f times g is less or equal expectation f squared to the power of one half multiplied with expectation g squared to the power of one half. And you now use this with f being just one. Yeah? So there's a one here. Yeah. So just the g is the guy. Yeah? So then this also is just one. So the g is the guy that we are looking at. So there is the expectation of g is less or equal expectation g squared to the power of one half. So my g is now this expression that is inside the supremum of x minus x tilde. So this guy is squared, but the su supremum of absolute values squared is the same as the supremum of the absolute values squared. Huh? So you can move the squared uh, inside yeah, and you have the result. Yeah, okay, you take again the square on the outsides. So this to the power of one half vanishes on the left and the right hand side. Yeah, I would like to consider this expression because I have this nice lemma here where we have also the square inside of the expectation yeah, and the to the power of one on the outside. So I like to look at this guy. But before, let me make a small sketch of the proof, yeah? even in the original form, yeah? so without looking at the squared. Yeah? Um, if you take the two stochastic processes, x and x tilde, and you take the difference, then you can, of course, write this difference. So the difference x of s minus the Euler scheme approximation x tilde of s, you can, of course, write it as the integral from 0 to s dx minus dx tilde, because the initial values of the two processes are yeah, here. So I have that this is the difference of the initial values, but the difference of the initial values this is actually zero because we consider that we start in the same initial value. And then it is the difference of the mu from the original stochastic process and the mu tilde integrated from zero to s dt and the difference of the sigma of the original process. So sigma of tau and x of tau and the sigma tilde of tau or piecewise constant coefficient dw. So I can write on the left-hand side the thing that is of interest to me in terms of the expression on the right-hand side. So I would like to estimate actually here the absolute value of x of s minus x tilde of s. So what you have is that you can make this less or equal Okay, you can take the absolute value here around these guys. Okay, there will be a constant in front, yeah, but maybe just drop this for a moment. And then you can also move the absolute value inside yeah, because the integral over the absolute values is larger than the absolute value of the integrals. The stuff in front here with the initial values, this is already zero. So this you can neglect. And you see that what you have now is a difference of the coefficients. And if you now look at the difference of these coefficients, yeah, you can now estimate these by our global Lipschitz condition. So Assume that you are inside the interval tau is between ti and ti plus one. 
then I know that mu tilde is actually the mu at ti and x tilde of ti plus one. So I can estimate this. So this here is mu, or maybe I write it down. So this is equal to mu evaluated at tau and x of tau minus mu at ti and x tilde of ti. And now you can estimate this using our global Lipschitz condition with a t minus ti plus an x of t minus x tilde of ti. Okay, and maybe you can give you yourself another term. So the x of t minus x tilde of ti. So two things have changed, the x to the x tilde and the t to the ti. Yeah, let's make that being two steps. So, and if I take absolute value, there will be a lesser equal here again. So this will be an x of t minus an x of ti. And then the second step is an x of ti minus an x tilde of ti. Okay, so that guy here is there. And what do we have? Yeah, here, you see that this here is already a lesser equal h. Okay, this here is a lesser equal, yeah, h to the power of one half. Yeah, you know, um, if you take the square of this, you will get a lesser equal h, yeah, because you can estimate uh, x at a later time minus x at an earlier time squared, yeah, in expectation, yeah, we throw the expectation over all this stuff here. Uh, by yeah, the time step size. And this stuff here is the same stuff, sorry, as the left-hand side. And now you have that on the left-hand side is less or equal h plus, okay, plus, and the important thing is plus an integral over the same stuff that you have on the left-hand side. And this smells like converse inequality. So the thing that you have on the left-hand side, the function on the left-hand side, can be bounded by some constant plus an integral over the function that you have on the left-hand side. So this looks very much like Cronwall's inequality. And if you have something like this, Cronwall's inequality, then you know that you can bound the solution of this integral inequality. Yeah? So you can bound your solution u by a times exponential bt. And now note that my time t comes from a time between zero and capital T. So I can just plug in here a capital T for the little t, and I have in front the h, or the h to the power of one half. Yeah? So the guy that you have from here or here. This is the main idea. So, but I work now with the function u the function u being expectation of take the maximum x minus x tilde squared. Yeah. This is now my function u for which I would like to work like for Cronwall's inequality. So I will start with this on the left-hand side, uh, plug in the stochastic process. So then I need to work the square inside. Uh, this is easy. Yeah, this is like uh, Cauchy-Schwarz again. Um, I have to work the absolute value inside. This is also not so easy. This is also easy. And I also have to work the maximum inside Yeah, under the integral, yeah, which is also maybe an easy step. Yeah? So that's the main idea. 
Okay, so let's start. So I start with this expression here on the left-hand side. So this is the guy I would like to estimate. And my estimate works if I have something that is constant times h plus integral of this expression again, because then I can apply Cronwell's inequality. So the first thing is that I plug in the stochastic process for x and x tilde. Yeah. So x of s minus x tilde of s is actually the initial value of the difference plus the integral from 0 to s mu dt sigma dw minus mu tilde dt minus sigma tilde dw. Everything is squared maximum over the little s from zero to little t and take the expectation. Now I use that a plus b plus c squared is less or equal three times a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So I can actually estimate the squared things, yeah, the three guys here individually. So difference of the initial value squared, difference of the maximum integral over mu difference squared, and maximum integral difference of the sigma terms, sigma integrals squared. So the initial value is zero because the two schemes start at the same initial value. So let's consider this guy here next. So I have the square outside of the integral. And I would like to move this guy yeah, under the integral. So I can use here Cauchy-Schwarz inequality again. Yeah, So this here is again. Schwartz. This moves the square inside. So next thing is I would like to remove the maximum. The maximum will re reappear inside later. So removing the maximum, yeah, take the maximum over all little s from zero to t. If I take the absolute value inside, Actually, I'm integrating a positive function. So the maximum is realized at the upper bound. Yeah? So if I take integral from zero to little t, absolute value, this is then bounding the maximum from zero to t. Well, and there's, there is um, a constant uh, t here. Okay, where is this coming from? Yeah, this is coming from my Cauchy-Schwarz inequality here. Yeah, I choose f times g is the guy. Yeah, I choose f to be 1. So if you choose f to be 1, you have the integral from 0 to s over the 1. Yeah, this gives you an s. And if you then choose the maximum, actually, you could also plug in little t. But forget about that. Just use capital T, my time horizon. So you see that I can estimate my drift part, expectation of the maximum over all times, integral, the difference of the mu coefficients, integrated squared. I can estimate this by a constant, capital T, expectation of the integral, and now mu minus mu tilde squared. So now I can use the Lipschitz condition, my global Lipschitz condition for the mu, so I can estimate mu evaluated at tau and x of tau minus mu evaluated at ti and x of ti by a constant multiplied with difference in time step, different in the two space variables yeah, in x. So x of tau minus x tilde of ti. Yeah, this holds here, of course, for the tau being in this interval. Uh, so I have to be now a little bit careful. Yeah, They will pop up an x tilde of ti belonging to the corresponding tau. To cope with this, I will actually split 
here the integral from 0 to t to a sum over all i integrals ti to ti plus 1. Yeah? So such that I can use on each partial integral this estimate. Yeah, now with this estimate, you see that you can do the same trick again. You have x at tau and x tilde at ti. Yeah? So two things have changed. Let's make this two steps. So the first part here is the tau minus ti. That's okay. And then you have another part that is x of tau minus x of ti. And then you have the part x of ti minus x tilde of ti. The blue part... I can now just rewrite as being the same stuff that I have on the left-hand side because I would like to work towards Cornwall's inequality. So I have started with x at s minus x tilde at s, maximum over all those guys. So I can just have the same term on the right-hand side because now I'm under the integral. And the other guy here is already giving me an h. And for this here, I will get an h after I have squared it from my little lemma. Plug this in now under the integral. So this is the thing we are looking at. Expectation integral mu minus mu tilde squared dt. So note you have still the square here. Yeah. So you make now the same trick again. You have a square here, a square here. So this is three times this guy squared, this guy squared, this guy squared. So that's the reason why we get a three times this guy squared. Yeah. Then we get a square again here and, and the same here. So now I have this lemma 78. So this was the guy yeah, where we had the square inside and the T minus S on the outside that we can estimate the second part here. So actually this guy, I can estimate it with a constant times h. I'm integrating over time, but I have a finite time horizon. So the finite time horizon then just give me a constant capital T. Yeah? So I just get a constant that depends on T. So you are in the situation that you can estimate this with um, a constant times h plus the integral over the same thing that you started with on the left-hand side. Okay, so this is the yeah, situation for the drift, yeah, which is uh, very nicely fits to, to Conwald's lemma. So for the stochastic integral term, yeah, for this, we use the dupe martingale inequality. So the dupe martingale inequality, this allowed us to, if we look at the maximum of the stochastic process, S between zero and T, yeah, then I can just estimate it with, a, with the last value. And we had the Ito isometry. So this is if I integrate dw squared, yeah, then this is like integrating sigma squared dt. So you can first pre-process your stochastic integral with these two guys. And then you see that the right-hand side is exactly of the same form as the stuff we had for mu. And you can do the same trick again and get the same estimate for um, mu. So in summary, I have that we have u can be estimated as c times constant h plus c times integral over u of s ds. So this is Cronwald's inequality that can apply here, can be applied here with u being this expectation of maximum 
x minus x tilde squared. Yeah, with converse inequality, now we have the corresponding result. Yeah? The A is our H, okay, and we get our estimate. Yeah? So this here is our strong convergence. So all this other stuff here is becoming the constant. Yeah. So also here the B, yeah, this is all becoming now the constant. Yeah, that was it for today. That is the proof of the strong convergence. Well, strong convergence is not so important for us. The weak conversion is the important guy. And to prove weak convergence, I will need Ito's lemma and the Feynman cuts theorem. Also a very nice session to review the two and the proof is quite uh, quite nice. Yeah, that was it for today. We will do that the next session.